Welcome, Professor Charles Knowles. Professor Knowles is the Chief of Surgery at Queen Mary University in Barts Hospital NHS Trust in London, UK, and Professor and Chair of Surgery at Queen Mary University and Bart School of Medicine and Dentistry in London, UK. Welcome, Professor Knowles. I'm pleased to be here. Thank you for, for joining us. Well, the first reason we invited you, and it's twofold, the first reason we invited to interview you is that amazing ballad to the NHS that was floating around a couple of days ago. Today, we're recording on the 21st of April, and two or three days ago, there was the ballad you wrote, and I know you have a penchant, which should ring a good chord, no pun intended, with our American audience, a pension for country Western music and ballads. And you had a very poignant, powerful ballad to the NHS. Could, can you just tell us a little bit about it? And then towards the end, we can tell people where to find it. Okay. Um, well, I'm a singer songwriter, um, as well as being a surgeon. And in fact, I'm in the process of recording an album at the moment um, in London, um, along those lines, less along the country line than some of the previous stuff that I recorded in Los Angeles. But um, I write a lot of songs and in fact it was my wife who um, said at Easter weekend that I must write a song in relation to the NHS and the Covid problems we're having at the moment. So the song that you've heard um, is something I've put together in about an hour um, at Easter weekend. It's recorded on an iPhone with um, uh, as a voice memo just me in this room, in fact, that we're in here, one of the spare rooms in the house. And, um, and a friend of mine, Shafi Ahmed, who's probably well known to the audience as well in the US for his digital technology prowess, um, produced the video for me um, with the help of the Press Association for the um, photographs. Um, and yes, that went out and has very rapidly um, gone viral in a limited way and been picked up by the media etc and that's fantastic so on the back of that we're raising money um, for the staff and families um, of people who have been affected by covid in the nhs and um, we raised our original target of ten thousand pounds today after only about 48 hours of having it out there so we're uh, very pleased um, with that um, the song itself is well, I mean, hopefully some of the audience have heard it, is like my other songs, lyrically strong in the manner of classic singer-songwriters like Cat Stevens, Paul Simon, etc., which is the sort of music that I'm recording at the moment. For, for those who, who haven't heard it, just, just to describe the, the photos uh, that are in it of deceased uh, healthcare workers in the NHS, uh, have you been contacted by any of the families of, of the people whose photos with uh, any kind of comments? Uh, yes, I have. Not uh, uh, very, only a few from the families themselves who obviously uh, um, uh, have picked up on the video and written very nice things. I mean, frankly, I've been humbled by some of the remarks I've had from people, but more so from um, other staff of in hospitals who know someone who's uh, passed on as a result of this. And of course, we've had people in our own hospital who have died, including a porter I knew quite well. Um, there was a porter at the Homerton Hospital where I used to work that I knew quite well. And, and like you, I'm sure um, I know people in Italy in particular who have died who are colleagues of ours. Yeah, 100%. Um, absolutely concur. Quite a few of the colorectal surgeons are in, in Italy and in Spain and general surgeons and, and others who we know. But I was particularly touched, as I'm sure was everyone who saw it, that the scope of the people you included in, in your song, not just physicians or, or nurses, but everyone across the healthcare spectrum, which was really important. Uh, perhaps yeah. also in this part of it, can, can you tell people how to access it? I think anybody who hasn't viewed it and heard it should. Um, yes, well, if you're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, um, or the internet, um, it, you can find it by its title, which is Ballad for the NHS, or under my name, and I'm listed under my sort of stage name, which is Charlie Knowles rather than Charles Knowles. And cool. anyone's very welcome to link in with me on any of those media. My Twitter handle is Prof C. Knowles, all one word. Well, thank you. And I, I think the fact that you hit your target of £10,000 so quickly uh, attests to the power of, of the message as well as the importance of the uh, of the mission 
I'd like to turn to another topic, which is that I know that uh, sometimes when people speak out, they're assigned with tasks saying, okay, you've identified an issue, you fix it. And I know that you're in charge of a, of a large number of, of medical students, undergraduates, as we might call them, uh, being deployed in, into the health force to help us out with this COVID-19 battle. Could, could you describe how that evolved and, and what's going on in that regard? Yes, you're quite right. Um, uh, you have to be careful what you say. I think the um, I was having a corridor conversation with our medical director and expounding on my views that I think the policy, one of the policies of our government of bringing retirees from the health service back um, to fight the COVID pandemic is fundamentally wrong in the sense that these are often older people who are more of a risk, as we all know of... Um, uh, being affected by the disease and dying and in fact a number of people who had retired have come back have died and their some of their pictures unfortunately are on my video and so um, I was making the point that in an organization like the NHS that has a chronic manpower shortage at the best of times um, even now in London teaching hospitals we should be seizing the opportunity here to bring the young into the health service and train them up in the hope that after COVID is passed, some of those um, continue to take jobs in healthcare. And I think it's a missed opportunity not to do that. Um, this conversation led to um, me being asked if I would manage the, uh, at that stage in its early evolution, the uh, deployment of medical students to the front line of our trust. Um, and I've been doing that for the last few weeks. Um, so we have four hospitals within our Barts Health NHS Trust. That's just a, uh, one of those facts of how the organisation is. Um, they're all four hospitals are in, well, three of them are in East London and St Bartholomew's itself is in the city of London. And I've deployed medical students to a total of about 20 departments across those four sites in a variety of roles. And we're probably at about a, certainly a number of more than 200 students now of different varying degrees of seniority um, are in position. Um, the feedback we've had both from the students and departments in which they're working has been excellent and reported in the media. In fact, it was in the Daily Mail um, and the Telegraph today in the UK. Well, congratulations on that initiative. Has it been seized upon and adopted by any of the other uh, London medical schools or elsewhere in the UK? When I last checked, no other London medical school was doing it on anything like the scale we were. Around the country, I know from colleagues that Birmingham are doing it, and I don't know what their success has been. Um, I'm guessing there are several other medical schools that are doing it. I mean, we have students from other medical schools who are now living with their parents in London who have joined the effort here. So people from as far afield as Swansea, Liverpool, as well as several from Cambridge University have in fact been deployed at the Royal London because their parents live in this area. So um, I suspect that some, uh, I think in fact I know that some of our students who live in the north of England uh, are being deployed in those places as well. Are they given a, a leave from participating in their regular education, which presumably is strictly by telemedicine now by a remote uh, video connectivity, uh, you know, some kind of a dispensation because they're doing this work instead, or are they expected to still participate in their full load of, of coursework? Okay, so you, you touch upon an important point there. So there's quite strict guidance around this, which was issued by the Joint London Medical Schools um, and with Health Education England about what they can do and can't do. Um, and we have an hours limitation of 24 hours a week so that in the remainder of the week they can continue their medical studies, um, obviously uh, um, by digital media. One of the important tenets of this, of course, is that the medical students who have signed up for this are obviously getting a lot of education, being on the wards and, and working in the roles that they do. And one's got to be careful, of course, not to disadvantage the other people, because at a medical school like the um, like Bart, we have a number of Malaysian students and from other areas of the world, of course, haven't got the opportunity to come back and uh, serve the nation in the way that our other students are.
So, so you touched upon an important point, um, which is where they're deployed and, and how they're deployed and talking about their being on the wards with patients. Are there any efforts to keep them away from known COVID positive patients given that risk? Uh, or, or are they preferentially sent to those areas after appropriate training and donning and doffing and, and, and the like? Or, or is it just wherever they're needed? Um, so, yes, uh, I mean, I won't go into the uh, d huge detail, but it slightly depends on the seniority of the medical student. So we've got a number of year five medical students, that's final year students in the UK, who would start as foundation year doctors, um, uh, you know, their first internship uh, in your terms in August of this year. And their um, foundation status is bring, being brought forward um, in fact, it's being initiated now so they can act as what we call interim foundation doctors. Now, that group of fifth years are doing the bulk of the really hardcore frontline duties. So they've been deployed into the intensive care um, units and emergency departments, etc. Um, the more junior medical students, that's years three and four, are actually much larger in number. And they're in a variety of roles that tend in the most part to be less high risk than the roles that fifth years are doing. I, I should say that all of our students, and this is a credit to them, have signed a letter, which in effect is a waiver, accepting the risk they're taking. And it is a risk, as we're all taking who see patients. Yeah, it, it's certainly a, a wonderful program, both in terms of service to the patients, uh, collaboration with the, uh, the staff, the faculty, physicians, and surgeons, and, and education to the medical students um, on, on all fronts. Um, just to shift gears slightly, uh, for the last few weeks, everyone's been talking about ramping down and, and decreasing uh, or eliminating elective surgery, going only to urgent procedures to, to save kit PPE, as well as to protect patients and healthcare workers. But now the conversation, at least in the U.S., is changing to more like how do we ramp back up? And, and clearly, as you say, the NHS sometimes, uh, like many health systems, can be a bit strapped for personnel and resources. Have, have you begun to, to figure out how to ramp back up? Well, it's a pertinent question. Uh, the discussions are starting. I mean, from a personal perspective, um, I stopped doing cancer surgery, you know, personally some years ago. And as you well know, I focus mainly on pelvic floor and functional coloproctology. So my elected practice has been completely obliterated during this, um, quite rightly, um, during the, uh, the COVID pandemic. And that is on the back, of course, of um, huge waiting lists even before all this started. So... You know, in the weeks leading up to this, I was operating on some patients who waited a year for surgery as it stands. So we are going to have a major problem and everyone knows that we're going to have a major problem. I think we're not ready to start doing elective surgery. I mean, the society over in the States, as here, is very well aware of the, um, uh, quite frankly, horrifying data that have come out of um, global surge in relation to transmissibility and outcomes in COVID patients, even from elective surgery. And we're need, going to need to think how we're going to restart elective surgery to maintain safety. And that's almost certainly going to be having clean host designated hospitals for elective surgery. And in the UK, I think there's a report come out by Sir David Sloman only last week, which I must confess I haven't read in full. I've only read the headlines of it. But this is going to require considerable cooperation between private and public sectors in the UK to get us back on track um, after we hopefully come out of the other side of this. Yeah, a, a very uh, challenging dilemma, certainly, uh, that we have to look forward to at the end. But I gather there has been good cooperation um, on some levels between the NHS and private hospitals even now, just to have some COVID positive and COVID negative hospitals. Uh, around London, certainly, and also in some of the other, Birmingham and Manchester and so on, uh, which is certainly a good model. Uh, yeah, the house. Yeah. So um, you know, thanks very much for taking time to speak with us. Congratulations on, on that incredible ballad and great to hear that you're doing an album. Um, looking forward to uh, getting hold of the album once it's released. Yeah. Thanks for the work you're I doing. Say I 
Yeah, I should say um, that uh, tomorrow I am uh, recording a single um, of the ballad uh, for the NHS um, with several musician friends of mine that come from bands uh, Primal Scream, um, people that played with Tom Jones, Van Morrison, Paul Weller. So um, we're in the studio tomorrow with social distancing, uh, sort of one at a time to put that track down. And so um, as a final remark to the um, US audience, look out for the single. And if you can download it on Spotify, all the money's going to charity, of course. Absolutely. Well, thanks so much, Charles. It's great to see you even, even remotely. And I, I look forward to seeing yeah. you in person when all of this affair is hopefully behind us. Yeah, thanks, Steve. It's a pleasure to talk to you as well. Fifteen floors and graveyard shifts run nine to five. An altered world through bloodshot eyes.